wherever you're listening in the world. It's a pleasure to welcome you to Israel Cast, the podcast powered by Jewish National Fund USA, your voice in Israel. I'm Stephen Shalowitz, first reminding you that for over 120 years, Jewish National Fund USA has been the premier philanthropic movement for the land and people of Israel. While best known for planting trees in Israel, JNF USA contributes to Israeli life in so many ways, including community development in the Negev and the Galilee, preservation of heritage sites, supporting people with disabilities, and connecting high school and college students to Israel. To learn more and to see how you can contribute, do visit jnf.org. Once again, jnf.org. Plus, if you haven't done so already, please subscribe, rate, and review us. Five stars, of course wherever you get your podcast, and we'd love it too if you shared the show with others in your orbit. All right, as for this episode, it's an absolute honor to welcome Shai Davidai to the program. Shai, who happens to be a personal hero of mine, has become the leading face and voice on calling out Jew hatred and anti-Israel rhetoric and actions on university campuses. He's assistant professor in the management division of Columbia Business School right here in New York City. His research examines people's everyday judgments of themselves, other people, and society as a whole. Born and raised just outside of Tel Aviv, Shai received his PhD from Cornell in 2015. And before joining Columbia Business School, Shai spent a year as a post doctoral fellow at Princeton and three years as an assistant professor of psychology at the New School for Social Research, also here in New York City. So let me tell you, he definitely knows his way around academia. And with that, we very warmly welcome Shai Davidai to Israel Cast, who joins us now on the line via Zoom from his home here in New York City. Shai, welcome to the program. Hey, Stephen. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the very kind and gracious uh invitation it's just thank you so much i'm, I'm just ple- happy to, to, to talk about these issues well there's so much to talk about when it comes to you and we've been wanting to have you on the program forever and indeed you have been just such a man in demand and really congratulations to you shy for being that voice and for being that face and for really stepping out and stepping up to talk about this Jew hatred and anti-Israel rhetoric that's been going on on campuses. And that's really where I'd like to begin, because as I hinted at before we started rolling, we do have listeners around the world, some in fact in countries Israel doesn't even have diplomatic ties with. So there may be people that might not be familiar with your journey, Shai. So if you would just sort of set the stage for us real briefly about your life before October 7th. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that's a question that a lot of people ask, like, what, where did you come from? Where, where, how did you pop up on our radar? And the truth is, I came from nowhere. I'm a nobody. I moved to the United States in 2010 uh, to pursue a PhD in social psychology. Uh, my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, came with me. She studied, she got an MFA at Columbia University. And for 14 years, we lived in the United States and just like everyone else, we were focused on work, we were focused on our family life, and we were focused on just getting by. Um, when October 7th happened, everything changed. But really, my story is not unique or even interesting. It's just a normal person who ends up being in a situation that feels like, okay, now I've got to do something. And so what was that trigger for you? October 7th was a huge trigger for everybody. But if you can take us then to that day, where you were, what happened, and then how you started speaking out. Yeah, so, you know, first we have to acknowledge October 7th was a horrible day for Jews everywhere and many non-Jews who just saw the horrific terror crimes. Um, and for the first few days, all my mental energy was focused on Israel. All my mental energy was focused on, you know, making sure that, you know, can we help people that are on the ground? Can we uh, can we get more donations? Can we connect people that have money with people that need money? That was everything I did for a few days. On October 12th, so five days after that horrific massacre, I was on campus at Columbia University and I observed for the first time a clearly anti-Semitic, anti 
Israel focused. And just to, to set the record straight in terms of chronology, October 12th, five days after October 7th, Israeli soldiers have yet to even, you know, approach Gaza. Um, it, the, many, many uh, Israeli forces were still fighting inside of Israel, trying to catch all the Hamas and the Islamic Jihad terrorists. And yet we saw on Columbia's campus about seven, 800 students chanting, celebrating everything that we saw on October 7th. And the moment I saw that, the moment I saw the hatred in people's eyes, I realized that I wasn't observing a difference in politics. I wasn't observing a difference in ideology. I was observing hate. I just saw people with hate in their eyes and their hate is not towards a government. It's not toward a policy. It's the, for the existence of Israel as a homeland for the Jewish people. And that was the thing that really spurred me into action. And as I said at the top of the show in your intro, I mean, you have been entrenched in academia all of these years. Your wife went to Columbia, as you said, she got her MFA there, you know, your own history at Cornell, at Princeton, at the New School. Had you seen this coming down the pipeline? Had you ever experienced this kind of anti-Israel rhetoric and this Jew hatred before? You know, it's one of the questions that I get a lot, which is, were you caught by surprise or did you see this coming? And the truth of the matter is that I did not see this coming. And many of us, I would say most of us, did not see this coming. Now, it's important to state that we did not see this coming, not because the signs weren't there, but because we weren't paying attention. Or when we paid attention, we kind of dis dismissed each instance as you know a singular instance that is not reflective of a general trend. So whenever we saw something happening on campus or off campus, we would brush it away as political differences, as ideological differences, as a fringe minority, as you know, lone individuals. And it's not that the signs weren't there, but we weren't, we did not put enough effort to connecting the dots in order to see what is the pattern. Now, when I say we, there have been people, people that like Barry Weiss, like David Badil, people that have written books about this, like Deborah Lipstadt. But for the majority of the people that I know in academia, we were really caught off guard. And we need we we must blame ourselves. We must take responsibility for our blindness, but we also must take that as a lesson for moving forward, that we must now stay on top of things. We must be aware and notice everything. And no longer do we have the privilege of brushing away certain instances and saying, this is not a problem. This does not, this is just a bad apple rather than, you know, an entire batch. The Band-Aid has been ripped off, and that's where I wanted to go with you right now. So what do we do about it? What do we do about that wound that is bleeding? Yeah, so so the first thing that we have to remember, you know, and we can spend a lot of time talking about the anti-Semitism, the wave of anti-Semitism on U.S. campuses mm -hmm. and U.S. society in general, in Canada, we're seeing it in Western Europe, we're starting to see it in other countries. But before we do that, we have to remember that the, the, the most, when you go to the ER, when paramedics treat you or when doctors treat you, they first treat the most dire life-threatening wound. And right now the most dire life-threatening wound, the bleeding wound is the hostages, right? We cannot deal with, we cannot fight for Jewish existence without acknowledging that there are 132 Jews and non-Jews, Israelis, that are right now being held hostage in Gaza. And, and to be honest, I do not know what the answer is for that critical wound. We then come to what do we do about anti-Semitism? And I think 
There are many, many different ways to deal. There are many, many different avenues to tackle anti-Semitism. One thing that needs to be clear is that it's, it is upon each and every one of us to fight anti-Semitism. We do not have the privilege of a one centralized organization with one inspiring leader to come and say, we will fight it this way. Because we're seeing anti-Semitism in colleges, we're seeing it in high schools, we're seeing, we're starting to see it in middle schools, we're seeing it in hospitals, we're seeing it in city level and county level, we're seeing it in business, uh, in, in certain businesses. We really have to be on top of things. And each and every one of us needs to focus on the things where it most affects their life, not be, not out of self-interest, but out of an idea that we are best, we're most effective when we focus on the things we know most about. So for me, it has been fighting anti-Semitism and support for terrorism on US college campuses, because that's the world I know. That's the language that I speak. I would be less effective talking about anti-Semitism in Hollywood, but there are incredible people fighting anti-Semitism in Hollywood, right? There are incredible people fighting anti-Semitism anti-Semitism in county level um, in all around the United States in different propositions that are popping up. But the important thing is that we it's upon all of us. We don't have the luxury of saying someone else will take care of this. And, you know, you've been again, a face and a voice, and you've been out there, you've been on social media, you've been at protests. Talk about the importance of just showing up, number one, and for those people that don't want to be, let's say, as public, talk about what they can do also, even very much behind the scenes. And I'm going to kind of, uh, you know, how we Jews like to ask a question, then answer the question immediately. I'm actually going to do that at this point, because, you know, I've had a number of non-Jewish friends that have reached out to me, asking me, Stephen, what can I do? And I've given them podcasts to listen to. I've given them books to read. I've given them people to follow on social media. And it's about educating. And I've told them, look, you educate yourself. And then I want you to share this information with your community, with your family, with your friends to create this kind of ripple effect. So I just wanted to share that at this point. But I'm wondering if you can address it and share your thoughts. Yeah, a, a great question. And I'm actually going to start with the end. Okay. Uh, which is the importance of non-Jewish activists, right? I'm going to start with them because that's such an important point that you just raised. When we as society, we in the United States fight for racial justice, we do not expect only people of color to fight for racial justice. We, people that are either white or passes white, like myself, I'm a, I'm a light-skinned Jew, we have an obligation to amplify our voices and fight with them for a more just society. The same thing with feminism. We can't leave the fight for uh, gender equality just for women. Men have an obligation to come and say, this is not your problem, this is our problem as a society. And I think when it comes to anti-Semitism, there is a misperception in society that that's a Jewish problem. And if it is a Jewish problem, then the Jews have to solve it. But in fact, it's not a Jewish problem because any kind of bigotry, hatred, um, prejudice in society is society's problem. So non-Jews actually have a an extremely important role here. I, as a Jew, as someone who speaks to the Jewish community, you know, my platform, while people think it's very large, it's actually quite limited. Because when I speak up first, you know, most of the people that will listen to me are unfortunately in the echo chamber of, of Jewish individuals and some non-Jewish allies. And second, I'm immediately discounted because of course this guy will say this because he's Jewish. That is why we need as many non-Jewish individuals to stand up and fight with us. Now, what does that fight look like? I really think that each and every one of us should fight with the skills that we have. So if you are a wealthy individual 
or just an individual with enough disposable income, money is one thing that organizations need, like JNF. There's an organization that I really um, uh, look up to, which is End Jew Hatred, which is an organization that is a civil rights organization for Jewish issues, right? It's not about Israel. It's just about Jewish civil rights. Uh, so you can do, you can give money. You need, you can show up in protests or even more, organize your own protests. There's nothing that says a protest needs to be 100, 200, 500 people. A protest can be five people standing up to a bigoted politician when they come to town, right? It could be speaking up on social media. People tend to discount social media as not the real world. Well, in 2024, social media is the real world. We have to remember that social media is where terrorists recruit other, uh, their operatives. Social media is where Hamas uh, broadcasted their crimes. But also social media is where we fight hatred and where we fight bigotry. So speaking up on social media. Uh, things like calling up, is uh, speaking up and calling out individuals, either one-on-one -on -one or in public spaces of this, what you just said is wrong, it's hateful, it's against Jews, it's anti-Semitic, whatever it is, like speaking up, calling out people. And I think one of the most interesting things that I have found is speaking up is scary. People are afraid to speak up. But it's also one of the purest, unadulterated rushes that exist, right? Because after you speak up, when you speak up for good, when you speak up for morality, you have that rush of doing something good with your life. It's better and healthier than drugs and alcohol and overeating and sexual indulgences and all the other things. It's just pure positivity. So while I know it's scary to speak up, I always tell people like, start small, see how it feels. You'll get hooked, hooked to speaking up because you know you're doing something good. And I should say, you're saying that not only as shy who's done that, but also as a psychologist as well. Yes, I mean, one of the interesting things, one of the, the, the basic lessons of social psychology is the idea of cognitive dissonance. That even if we have, we, we're somewhat ambiguous in our attitudes about something, we're worried about acting in some way, the moment we act, our minds experience a dissonance that is, you know, our minds abhor that dissonance. So they, they resolve the dissonance by strengthening our resolution. So one of the things that I always say is like, when you speak up, you'll see that you're not just feeling good about yourself, you'll get feedback from other people and you will realize that you won't regret what you just did. Indeed. Shai, I wanna go back for a moment to your own story. So October 7th happens, as you said, October 12th is when these horrific protests, these pro-Hamas protests broke out on Columbia's campus, and they just continued until we saw the encampment, which ultimately was, was taken down. You were teaching during this whole time, and you were also speaking out during this time. If you can talk a little bit about what life was really like for you then, and the support that you got, and the vitriol that you got as well during those months. Uh, I, I would say that the important thing for me, and this is important for me as an educator, it has nothing to do with my Jewish or Israeli identity. My, my identity as an educator is something that I take extremely seriously. And when I started teaching way back in graduate school, I made a promise for myself that the students always come first. No matter what's happening in my life, personal, professional, the students always come first. And I, and I make it clear to the students and to the world that I draw a clear line between what happens in the classroom and what happens outside of the classroom. I never let my advocacy, my social activism seep into the classroom to the extent that I'm not sure that all of my students even know what I've been doing 
in the past seven months because it was extremely important to me. Unfortunately, there are professors that not only fail their students by not engaging in this, but they actually actively bring in the world, their own views, their own opinions into the classroom. As someone who believes in education, I believe that I will be doing, I would be doing my students a disservice by bringing my own opinions to the table. So I bring opposing views and we and we have engaged in critical thinking, but it's never the shy show. It's not the shy that the guy show. So that's important for me to, to state because in a way, I lived a sort of bifurcated life where I was in classroom, I was just a professor. It was it was almost like pre-October 7th. Like it was just, everything was normal. I am just a professor. The moment I stepped out of the classroom, the world is completely different. And when you speak out, you um, you experience a lot of love and a lot of hate. When I started speaking out at the beginning, I was just flooded with a lot of supportive, incredible messages to which I'm grateful for. And at first I wasn't even sure why I'm getting all these messages, right? The, the very first video of mine where I spoke up and went viral, uh, people started telling me like, thank you so much for your speech. And this is not a joke. I'm being completely serious. For the first few weeks, I was I did not understand what speech they were talking about because I didn't see myself as giving a speech. All I did was speak out my mind. It wasn't something that I was reading out loud. It was literally a stream of consciousness that people reacted to. But a few weeks after the love and the support came in, the vitriol started coming in. At first, it was a few drops in the in, in the ocean, and then it was like a tsunami. And it was coming from where, Shai? From all over. It, I, it was on social media. Um, it was on, um, I, I would get, um, sorry, I would get snail mail, like actual letters to my office. I get uh, sometimes on campus, people, you know, would see me, either shout something at me or take a picture of me and then write it, post something on their WhatsApp groups or on their social media accounts. And I still don't know how to deal with that. I had to grow a very thick skin very early on because I'm a very sensitive person. I take things to heart. Now, I don't care what people think about me. Other than a few people that I, you know, that I love, like my wife, my my fam, my immediate family, my children. Most people, I don't care for good or bad what they think of me. But I did not understand why I'm getting so much hatred. When when someone who doesn't know me hates me, that really confuses me because if you hate me for something that you that is me, that's something that I've done to you, then at least I can ponder that and I can work with you and talk and, and try to remedy. But but it wasn't the case this way. And the 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 watershed moment for me was when I, I met this person, um an Israeli guy who told me they don't hate you. Mm -hmm. You are a placard. You're a poster upon which they put all their hate. So yeah. They, they see your face because you are so outspoken and, and now are part of this movement. They see your face and they just say, we hate what that face stands for, even if it's not something that I personally stand for, but they project what they think I stand for. And that's what they hate. And you haven't gotten over that yet, have you? I don't mean to play psychiatrist here, but I'm just wondering, have you have you been able to to deal with that? Because that's got to be really, really tough. And and I have to say, though, Shai, good on you, though, for being able to separate classroom from your activism work, because, again, I would imagine just how difficult that is. It, it, it was so I would say it was difficult, but it was also in a way very selfish. I'm not doing mm. any out of. Yeah, not just altruism. Like I, I really enjoyed having those 
few hours every week where I just get to be a professor. Something, you know, I truly believe that education is the way forward. It's not the only solution, but it's a solution. And I have taken on a role and I want to make sure that I complete my role in the best way possible. But but you're right, with hatred, it's you I don't believe that you can get used to hatred without losing part of your humanity. And it's extremely important for me to keep my humanity in the same way that I force myself, and sometimes it's hard, but I force myself to see the videos and the footage coming out of Gaza because I remind myself that despite the fact that this is a war that's been imposed on us, on Israel, and despite the fact that Hamas started it, the fact that there are civilian casualties is horrible. Now, we can argue about what's the reason, what can we do about it, is it proportional? We can argue about all of those things, and we each have our own views. But we must force ourselves to acknowledge the pain of the other side so we don't lose our humanity. And in the same way, we must force ourselves to face the hate that we that we receive and and not you know completely close ourselves off to the hate because that hate comes from some passion from someone who experiencing pain and they're translating their pain to hatred and again so I don't lose my humanity I force myself to deal with some of the hate. Now I can't deal with all of the hate because we're talking about thousands of messages a day but at least acknowledging that even those that hate me are humans. Shai, your activism reached such a crescendo that you got locked off of Columbia's campus. And I want you to take us there in that moment and what was going through your head then. Yeah. That is one moment when I got barred from entering my own campus that is a moment that I have yet to fully process. And it's been a month and two days uh, from the moment we're recording this now. Because there, people have seen the videos. Of, uh, the, those videos were, were aired all over. People yeah. saw me reacting. And what people, some people don't realize, I guess, is I was caught off guard. Mm -hmm. I was learning with the rest of the world of what's happening. And you can see the shock on my face. And you can also see, and I'm a bit ashamed of it, that I, for a very short moment, I lost my temper. Because I was really, I was just, I wasn't even angry. I was hurt. I was just hurt. And not as a professor, not as a Jew, not as an Israeli. I was hurt as shy that they died facing another person, Cass Holloway, who's the chief operating officer at Columbia. And we were less than a foot apart. And he looked me in the eyes and said, you cannot come into the campus. And that was just emotionally painful. Now, over the past seven months, I've learned to take pain and turn it, turn it into activism, take pain and turn it into passion. But if you watch those videos, for the very like the first two three minutes, it's just pain. It's it's just feel. I really felt like he does not see me as an individual. And when I say he does not see me, it's not him, Mr. Holloway, as you know, a father, a parent, whatever. But Mr. Holloway, as in his official capacity as the COO of Columbia. Later on, when I when I spent more time thinking about it, because I was just I was hurt, and then that turned into anger, and then that turned into activism. But later on, when I thought about it, I realized that he was just doing his job, and that scared me the most. Because I can deal with people that hate me, I can deal with people who don't like me, uh, or pity me, or whatever it is. I cannot. I do not know yet how to deal with indifference. I don't know how to deal with people who are just doing their jobs. 
because for millennia, our people have been persecuted. And by the way, other people have been persecuted as well by a few core individuals that hated us and a majority of people who are just doing their jobs. And that's the scariest part for me. So when you look at that video, that's what I want you to keep in mind, my pain, my anger, and then my fear. Ultimately, you were allowed back on campus. Two but, days ago. Uh, yeah. And it's been, and it was what, a month and change, right? Yeah, exactly. That it took that, it took that period of time. Who, who has been the highest ranking Columbia administrator, for example, that you've met with? You have still not met with President Shafiq, and I know that you would like to. Yeah, uh, uh, President Shafiq will not meet me. She won't even respond to my emails. And there have been multiple, multiple times. Um, in late October, I the highest ranking person I met was the senior vice president. Um, it was a pleasant yet useless meeting because it was clear that this person, Jerry Rosberg, came to try and shut, shut me up rather than work with me. Even though I started the meeting with saying, I want to work with you. I'm not fighting. I'm not against Colombia. I'm fighting for Colombia. Later on, I had a meeting with the COO, Cass Holloway, the general counsel of the university, so the highest you know, legal authority in the university, uh, Felice Rosan, and the vice president of public safety, George, George Lewis. And that meeting, which I recorded, and the recording is on social media, it's on my YouTube page, that meeting, I came on, came on to very optimistic and left very pessimistic because it started with me just trying to establish a few facts. The first question was, can we acknowledge that Hamas is a terrorist organization? And the highest ranking people at Colombia could not even do that on record. It took them two, three minutes of stammering until they were able to say, okay, we accept the fact that Hamas is a terrorist organization. So that was for me another one of those watershed moments when I realized this goes very deep. And again, not because of people that hate Jews or Israel, but because people are just, quote unquote, doing their jobs. And so your message to President Shafiq, should she be listening to this episode, is what? See, the, the, the message has changed quite a bit. It's, it evolved with what we've seen in the world. For the first few weeks, my message was just, please condemn Hamas. Please condemn the Islamic Jihad. Please condemn what we just saw on October 7th. And I truly believe that if we had seen an uh, unequivocal, loud, strong condemnation of Hamas, not a two-sided condemnation, not a this side and that side, but just what Hamas did was wrong. Raping women is wrong. Kidnapping elderly is wrong. If we'd seen that on October 7th, 8th, 9th, or 10th, history would have been different. The, the the haters on campus would have still, you know, existed, but the, their momentum, their ability to attract so many sheepishly, yet good yet sheepishly students, but just follow them, would have been really thwarted because there wouldn't have been a moral vacuum. So that was my message early on. We're past that stage. I think that President Shafiq, and I don't think it's just her, you know, it's not personal for me. All of the administration need to start taking this issue seriously. And the trustees, too. And the trustees. Well, trustees, I, to be honest, I have lost all trust in the trustees, Not no, no pun intended. I believe that the trustees are only there for their self-interest, are only there, they don't even care about the educational aspect of Colombia. They only care about Colombia as the, the largest private landlord in New York City, right? They only care about the fact that Colombia owns the ground upon which Rockefeller Center is, uh, is has been built and getting millions and millions of dollars of rent a year. That's all the trustees care about. But the administration, at least 
supposedly should care about education. And I think they should start taking this seriously, meaning deal with the faculty that openly support Hamas, find ways to censure them and remove them from classroom, remove them from any uh, interaction with students, PhD students and the, and the like. They need to air out the stables and, and remove any hateful person from the administration. By the way, not just anti-Semitic. I don't want the administration to have racist people. I don't want the administration to have homophobic people. I don't want the administration to have transphobic people. And I don't want them to have anti-Semitic people. They need to completely disband the organizations, the student organizations that engage in seven months of uh, terrorizing Jewish students on campus and which then uh, created the illegal encampment and then the uh, the violent occupation of Hamilton Hall. It's not enough just to make a few uh, cursory suspensions. They need to disband these organizations. We're talking about many organizations on campus. They need to hold accountable the faculty advisors of those organizations to make sure that if you're a faculty advisor, you have responsibility. They need to examine the curricula, the everything that we teach on campus without infringing on academic freedom. We need to make sure that no hateful rhetoric, no hateful content is being taught to students, right? And again, not just anti-Semitism. Like I wouldn't want a professor teaching a class on, you know, the pros and cons of slavery. Of course, slavery is bad. We shouldn't have a class on pros and cons. So why should we have a class on the pros and cons of a Jewish homeland? Why should we have a class on the pros and cons of the Holocaust? We don't have a class, but but we have classes that you know minimize or or even like don't even mention the Holocaust as an issue, right? So we need to have a clear moral standing in the university. And finally, the university must adopt a definition of anti-Semitism. There is a definition, the United States government and the Department of Education have adopted the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism. And I've said it once and I've said, I'll say it a million times. If it's good enough for the president of the United States of America, it should be good enough for the president of Columbia University. And if President Shafiq thinks that she is smarter than the president of the United States, then she should come out and say why she thinks that she's smarter than the president of the United States of America. But if she does not have an argument for that, then she must adopt the IRA definition of anti-Semitism. Before we move on, just another question about President Shafiq. So you've never gotten a response from, say, for example, her admin or from her chief of staff or another person in her office saying, I'm just so sorry, she's unable to meet you, full stop the end. I mean, I don't understand what is she afraid of? And, you know, we're we're recording this, what, uh, towards the end of May, school's out right now, so she should have time on her hands. If I knew, I would probably work to reduce her fears. I truly believe that what happened was that the administration headed by President Shafiq, but not just her, the administration saw me as speaking out for myself rather than speaking out for a community. They saw, they, they made a very crude and I would even say inhumane calculation. They saw 800 hateful protesters on one end for months terrorizing the Jewish community. And they saw one professor and maybe a handful of students speaking up. And they said, it's way easier to deal with the professor than to deal with the mob. And when I met with the senior vice president in, in late October, I told him, you think this is a Shai Davidai problem. This is not a Shai Davidai problem. This is a Jewish community problem. I am not the spokesperson of the Jewish people. I have never uh, suggested that, and I don't believe that I am, but I speak 
for many, many, many Jewish people. And it, until you realize that, you will not be able to solve this. But their actions show that they have yet to realize that, which is why, you know, I am the one being investigated for my social activism, which is why I was the one being barred from campus. Because we have to remember why I was barred from campus. I was told by the chief operating officer that they cannot guarantee my safety if I go on campus, on the illegal encampment. That is logically the same as telling a woman, don't leave the house at night because New York City is dangerous and we cannot protect you. It's the same logic. The, the person that is hated, the person that is being victimized, the person that is being threatened is told to remove themselves from the public rather than dealing with the root cause, which is the people that hate them, the people that victimize them, the people that target them. And Colombia did a very problematic calculation. And if you were a Black professor, that never would have happened. Look, I don't, we, we could never know, but I can tell you that in the past, when it has, when people spoke up against other types of bigotry on campus, the university always, without exception, sided with the people that spoke against bigotry rather than with the bigots. The only time in recent memory where Columbia University sided with the bigots rather than those that speak up against bigotry is now. And the only difference is that the bigots are anti-Semitic and that those that are speaking up against bigotry are Jews. That's the only difference. Unless the university have a, has a different explanation for why now it's different, the, the most uh, concise explanation is that because Jews are being targeted, we are not a high priority for the university. And that is why we're seeing what we're seeing. So Shai, as we record this, as I said, it's towards the end of May, school's out. I'm just wondering if you can look in your crystal ball. What do you think is going to happen this fall? What does that look like on the Columbia campus as well as other campuses throughout the country? Yeah. So I would start by saying I'm always afraid of giving a fool's prophecy. No, no one knows what will happen. The world can change uh, in a heartbeat. But there are a few things that we know for sure. Hate does not go away. Radicalization does not go away. Anti-Semitism does not go away on its own. Yeah. Right? Hate is like fire. It, it will find it, it will find something else to ignite. How that hate will exhibit itself is that's the real question. Another thing we can also again know for sure, the professors. And those are, they are the real problems. The professors that ignited this hate, that indoctrinated students for decades, they are still on campus. There's no reason to believe that they will act differently. In fact, if the last seven months have taught us something is that these professors face complete impunity. So they are, will be coming back with a vengeance. A third thing we know for sure is that while 25% of the student body graduated, right, the seniors, 75% is going to remain on campus, meaning that 75% of the protesters, the illegal encampment, will still be there, and they will be joined with a new crop of first-year students that if they had not been already radicalized by social media and in high school, they will be radicalized by those professors. So we know those are the things that we know for sure. Hate doesn't go away on its own. The professors who are the main problem are still there. The students, the you know, the foot soldiers, I would call them, most of them are still there. And the administration hasn't signaled that they're going to change. So now the question is, how will this exhibit itself? What I believe we'll see is we'll see a few protests in the beginning of the year as a flexing of the muscles, showing we are here, we're here to stay. And it has nothing to do with what's going to happen in Gaza or in Lebanon. We have to remember that for seven months, 
the uh, Israel has been shot at from Lebanon and, and civilians have been dying and no one talks about that. So we're going to see that. I believe that around October, October 7th, October 8th, October 9th, we're going to see protests again uh, as a anniversary for, you know, the things that we're seeing now. And again, we need to learn from history. Uh, April 68th, we, there were uh, illegal encampments at Columbia, right? There were a lot of uh, protests at Columbia. And then April 69th, we saw an annual um, anniversary of those protests. So we're going to see that as well. We're going to see an apartheid week, right? They've been doing that for years. We're going to see an apartheid week and again, coming with a vengeance. And we're going to see again, Jewish students that are being terrorized, that are feeling uncomfortable going to class. The one thing that's going to be different is that we will not be caught off guard. We are not, we, the Jewish community and our Jewish and non-Jewish allies, we are going to be prepared for this fight. We are going to stand our ground, mm -hmm. non-violently, but we're going to stand our ground to make clear that we belong in the university, just like everyone else, and that we, uh, that the university has an obligation to protect us in the university, just like everyone else. So Shai, for that 25% that's coming in, how would you suggest they prepare themselves? What should they do before they step on campus? The Jewish students, I would, I would, I, I assume you're talking about the Jewish students. Let's say the Jewish students, yeah. The first thing I would say is read up. I want every Jewish student and every Jewish parent or grandparent listening to this to understand no matter where you send your kid to school in the United States, in Canada, in Western Europe, they are likely to deal with anti-Semitism and hatred for Israel and not just as Israel, but as the homeland for the Jewish people. They are going to face it in classrooms, from professors, from their peers. They're going to face it on campus through protests. They're going to face it on social media with other students attacking them. Mm -hmm. They need to be aware of this. You cannot, the only way to, to run away from it is to hide your Jewishness, which I do not recommend for anyone, A, because it never works, and B, because no one should be closeted for any part of their identity. So B, you need to know you're going into a fight, a nonviolent fight, but a fight. Once you know that, you need to come prepared, meaning that you need to read up. You need to do your homework. You need to learn about the history of Jewish persecution and about the history of anti-Semitism and how what we're seeing now is not unique it's not about what Israel's government is or isn't doing in Gaza. It's not about 1967. It's not about 1948. It's 1945. It's 1903 in Kishinev. It's uh, it's 17 uh, CE in, in the Second Temple. What you're seeing now is not unique. You need to learn about Israel's history. And I would, rec and I would recommend learn it from different narratives. I'm not want a person to indoctrinate and say only read one side. I would say read five sides, read different perspectives, read a Palestinian perspective, read a Jewish Israeli perspective, read a Christian evangelist perspective, but read as much as you can and be prepared to get into arguments. Even if you have all the knowledge, you still need to find your own voice and your own comfort in standing up for yourselves. So, you know, even if it's just mock arguments that you have at home with your parents, and I've been, by the way, uh, encouraging a lot of parents to argue with her, with her children and telling them like, prove to me that this is not a genocide. Now you and I clearly know what the definition of genocide is and what it isn't. You and I both know that the ratio of civilian to Hamas terrorist uh, casualties in Gaza is one of the lowest in modern war warfare. You and I both know that this is not a genocide, but when you get you know, attacked on, in class or on the quad or wherever it is with some other student or a professor 
accusing Israel, accusing the Jewish homeland of engaging in genocide, what convinced me that they were wrong, right? So people need to be prepared for this because they will face this. And if they're not prepared, it will just be a horrible experience, or, or a, not a horrible experience, but a very bad experience for them. And then the last thing I would say is find a community. Don't even wait for your orientation. Reach out to a Jewish community now. Reach out to the Chabad's wherever you go to college or to the Hillel or to the SSI, Students Supporting Israel. At Columbia, we also have Arye, another organization. Create a community. It's way easier fighting, but also just existing when you exist in a community, in a group of people. And, you know, find your minion. It doesn't have to be a religious minion. It can be a secular minion. It could be a Jewish book club minion, but find your minion. It's easier to deal with everything when you're 10 or more than when you're one or two. Jai, I'm so glad you brought up SSI, Students Supporting Israel, because how crazy is it that Maya Platek, an Israeli student, was elected as the Columbia Student Government President for 2024-2025? Yeah, well, we, we have to uh, remember, she was elected the president of a certain college, mm -hmm. uh, the General Studies College, which is the school for students that join as older students, so not straight out of high school. Some of them are 19 and 20. Some of them are 25 and 30. 30 you know, it's right. 30. And and it, that gave me a lot of hope because it showed me that at least some aspects of the university are still rational, human-focused uh, parts. And I just hope that other schools also see that and say, hey, wait, there's an Israeli woman, an impressive Israeli woman, and she's not the demon. I might disagree with her on some stuff, and that's okay. We're in college. You're supposed to disagree. Mm -hmm. But she is not the devil. She's not a, you know, a horrible person, just like I am not a horrible person. And by the way, just like most of the leaders of the illegal encampments and the overtake of Hamilton Hall are probably not horrible people. But we have to have that conversation. When they are unwilling to have that conversation with us, that's where society, you know, phrases at the seams. Yeah, I'm going to invoke actually Ido Aroni, who was Israel's consul general here for years in New York City and is a public diplomacy specialist. And we've had him here several times in the program. I consider him a friend. And he has talked about this 10 20, 70% paradigm. 10% of people we've just lost. They're never going to be supportive of the state of Israel. They're always going to be Jew haters. The 20% are people like us, let's say. And then the 70% are the vast majority of people that are out there that really don't know a lot about Israel. They might have heard things on the news and they they might have a misguided view, but they're not, they're not bad people, but they just are a little bit clueless when it comes to Israel. Uh, many people, some in the Jewish community, but mostly in the non-Jewish community. And it's those people that really need to be reached out to and to be engaged with. So as we talk about Maya assuming her role, hopefully she'll be an emissary to be able to do that, to reach out to that 70%. Uh, to say, hey, look at who I am, and let's talk about Israel. Let's talk about the Jewish people. I just wanted to raise that right. as, as a and point. I, and I, they're absolutely right. And this is why I started by, you know, when you asked me before, I said about the non-Jewish Americans. Exactly, yeah. I think what many non-Jewish Americans do not understand, and not out of ill will, not because they have done anything wrong, it's because the media doesn't tell the story. Yeah is that what Israel stands for, 85%, 90% of what Israel stands for is what the United States stands for mm -hmm. and what Canada stands for and what Britain and France and Germany stands for and what most Western democracies stand for, right? Most people in Israel, Jews, Muslims, Christians, Druze, um, Baha'i, uh, Turkis, uh, or in all our other religious and ethnic minorities, most of what we want is safety, is equality, is liberty, 
just like Americans here in New York, in California, in Wisconsin, in Ohio, in Michigan, in Texas, in Kentucky, right? That is what most of us want. This is why we do not have a totalitarian government or a dictatorship. We have a democracy, the only democracy in the Middle East, right? And one of the other things that I keep reminding to people is that there are five Americans, American people that are hostage in Gaza right now, right? And their only crime was being in Israel when Hamas attacked. So when you see these pro-Hamas protests happening, I want you to remember they are cheering on the, the those who hold American hostage captive. There is no difference between them, the Hamas, and the Taliban, and ISIS, and North Korea. And in fact, they are, you know, openly and explicitly in an axis of engagement, what they call the axis of resistance, but we in the in the West, in the demo democratic world, know that it's the axis of terrorism. Back to students, what is your message then, Shai, or the direction that you would like to share, let's say with high school students, parents that are beginning to select colleges? My, my message is, first of all, you know, there are things that haven't changed. You know, the quality of schools in terms of education, in terms of, you know, research, in terms of, uh, you know, what you're going to study, that hasn't changed. And that should be an important thing. And another thing that hasn't changed is, you know, the level of community in certain schools. Some schools are commuter schools, some schools are, are embedded. There are things that haven't changed and they shouldn't change and they should be part of your decision. Something has changed. And that's the level of acceptance of anti-Semitism. And other than a few righteous universities, there has been a level of acceptance of anti-Semitism across all of US colleges. Some of them accept more of it, some of it accept less, but they all accept some anti-Semitism. So my message, it's not where you send your kids or where, if you're a high schooler, where you go to college, but how, how you send your kids, how you go to college. Are you preparing yourself to go to college? And it's not just preparing in terms of the, you know, buying books. It's not just buying uh, cheap furniture in Ikea. It's also about preparing yourself to be Jewish in public. Because right now, being Jewish in public is unfortunately a controversial thing. But we want to normalize it. That is why we're doing it. That is why I started wearing a Magen David, a Star of David, you know, post October 7, because I am trying to normalize the existence of Jews in public. And that's, so uh, I, in fact, encourage everyone, every high schooler, every college student, go and buy the biggest Star of David that you can get. You see, mine is very big, and put it out there. And in fact, I've been encouraging non Jews to put a yarmulke and a Star of David and go into one of these encampments and see what happens, right? Great idea. And and I think for non-Jews, then they can get a sense of how we all feel. Maybe even worse, try to hold a, 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 an Israeli flag and see what happens. But for the Jewish students, like you're Jewish, I know you want this to be a private part of your life because that's your life and your decision. It has been made public, they have made our identity political, and we have to lean into it. We have to show the world that we are not afraid. The reason I asked the question, Shai, is, well, of course, I wanted to know your answer, but I've heard from parents saying, I don't want to send my kids to Brown, Northwestern, Columbia, Penn, and the list goes on, because the parents have said, I don't want to pay them for that experience. I don't want to perpetuate that Jew hatred there. So I'd rather have my kids go to another school, even if it's not an Ivy school, even if it's not their dream school. And I'm just wondering if you can address that. Yeah. First of all, let's start with this. There's nothing special about Ivy League schools. As someone who got his PhD in one and is working at another and got a postdoc in a third one, these schools are we have some incredible, amazing professors, and we have 
dumb as a great professor. <laughs> Just like any other university, right? It, 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 there's nothing special. These are elitist schools. Now, by being elitist, they open people up for, you know, getting more elitist jobs. But you have to ask yourself at some point, is that what you want? I still think Columbia has potential to be a great school. I'm not saying it is. That's why. And I'm by the way, it. we should share that you love Columbia. I, I love Columbia and I love Cornell, mm -hmm. you know, and despite all its flaws, that's why I'm fighting for it. You do not fight for something that you hate. You fight for something that you love. And I'm fighting for Columbia, not against it. So stop thinking about brand names, I would say, and start thinking about where would your kid be happiest and where would they flourish the most? Mm -hmm. In terms of money, I completely agree with you. I don't know if I would send my kids and my money to a school that engages in BDS. I see BDS as a nonviolent act for a violent cause. So I would not send my kids to anywhere that, that has a BDS referendum mm -hmm. for colleges like that. But with all the other schools, I would say, yes, send your kid, send your money, but not a penny more. What does that mean? I would not donate to any of these schools until they step up. I will not, not even a dollar. Some people do the dollar pledge. I wouldn't even send them a dollar. I would not buy any school paraphernalia, like no shirts. I will not give Columbia or any other school free advertisement, even though I know people want to feel connected in community. We need to see these schools as a place where we get an education. We pay for an education. And this has to be clear in people's minds. Universities treat students like customers. They are they do not treat them as students, they treat them like customers. And as long as you're being treated as a customer, that doesn't mean that you walk away, you just treat the university as a corporation. You would not donate money to Starbucks and you would not, you know, but if you're if you want coffee, and Starbucks is the only place around, you'd go and get coffee from Starbucks. And the last thing I would say about people saying, let's, you know, let's pull our kids away from these schools. My grandmother, when uh, in the 1950s, was basically pushed out of her university in Romania. She finished her first year of school. She wanted to be a doctor. And they told her, we have enough Jews. We reach our quota. You're not going to continue to second year to be a doctor. And she quit school. She never went back. In the past, they have pushed us out of schools. Now, because we're in a so-called enlightened era, they can't push us out. We have a Supreme Court, we have a democracy. So they're going to make life incredibly hostile for us so we push ourselves out. I will not give them the benefits of doing that. That is why when people ask me, why don't you quit Columbia? Why don't you go somewhere else? And I have gotten some job offers at other universities. I say, I will not give Columbia, the benefits, if they want to get rid of me, they have to show the world that they are unwilling to accept one of the most vocal proponents for Jewish life in campus. Maybe in the future, when I feel like Columbia has accepted me, then I will decide if I want to stay at Columbia or go somewhere else. But we cannot give them the benefit of, you know, ghettoizing ourselves. You want to put us in a ghetto, you have to do the work, and we will fight it. But we will not put ourselves in it. Well said. And, you know, I, I was laughing when you said that these universities are businesses because someone shared with me that actually Harvard is just a hedge fund that gives out degrees. Harvard is a uh, is actually a real estate agency, that, a real estate uh, company that gives out degrees. MIT is a venture capital that gives out degrees. And Columbia is a New York City landlord. As you said. Right. You know, and, and we should and we and we should point out that Colum uh, that Harvard's applications really took a dip. The, yes. The unfortunate thing is, again, when we go back to the elitist the brand name, yeah. these universities can afford to take a dip. And that's the problem. They have become a, a complete lack of accountability. You know, we had banks that were too big to fail. And there was a lot of hurrah about like. It's incredible that these banks were bailed out. Well, these universities are too big to fail. When you admit 4% of your applicants, that means that even if 
now half the people that would have applied don't longer apply, you can still admit 8% and be extremely selective and keep the same number of incoming students. What I want people to remember, and maybe for people listening, if you apply to any one of these schools and didn't get in, look at the encampments and you see who got in instead of you. And now you tell me if these are elite universities or not. That's a drop the mic moment, Shai. Listen, just maybe one or two other questions because I'm super mindful of the clock and of, and of your time. With this just sort of torrent of information that we're faced with in the news and the, this whole deluge on social media, how do you manage that? And where do you get your news from? The truth is I don't manage. I don't think anyone manages. Mm -hmm. we, we are we're living through a time where we have all the information and the problem is not the content it's the it's the forum and the media um how do we get the information i get my news a from israeli um news sources b from uh cnn and ap uh the associated press i do not get my news from the new york times because knowing i know everything that has been happening in colombia and I know how Columbia, uh, how the New York Times have um, covered it. And I know that it's just been complete lies or half-truths. Maybe they're not telling half-truths about other things, but it's enough for me to say, no, not, not reading you, not giving you interviews. I uh, get my information from social media as well. Uh, I try to follow people that I agree with and people that I disagree with so I can see what everyone is sharing. When things are ex especially egregious, when I see something especially egregious, either for Israel or against Israel, for Jews or against Jews, I Google it. First, I don't immediately share. I don't immediately tell people. I Google it to see, you know, is it true? And many times I've found out this is over exaggerated. This is fake news. And then I just remove it from um, my uh, this. And honestly, I talk with people. I talk with people. I, I talk. There was a moment in time a few months ago where I had some questions about what's happening in Gaza. So I called my brother, who was spending five years in reserve duty. And I said, well, you don't know all of it, but you know your specific angle, and you know way more than I do, than Stephen Schalowitz does, or any other person that I can talk with. Tell me your view. Now, I'm not going to take his views as, you know, mm -hmm. the sermon, you know, the top of the mount, but, you know, we're not going to, it's not coming from uh, Hal Sinai, but... I'll, I'll listen to many, many different people. That's one of the things I've loved about doing Israel Cast, the vast array of people that we've had here on the program. I guess final question then for you, Shai, how do you switch off? Uh, I don't. <laughs> uh, I, really listen, I, I have to attest the fact that you don't because you are working 24-7 and we're yeah. just so glad that we were able to, to mm -hmm. make this happen today. You've got to remember, and, that, and I think that really frustrates people that want to meet me, and I try to meet yeah. a lot of people and be a lot of podcasts and interviews and speaking at different organizations. Everyone well, wants a piece of you, Shai. Well, it, it, you know, and, and, and by the way, they, I, I actually don't think they want a piece of me. They want a piece of the message. That's the important thing. It's not about who I am. Yeah, but, however you articulate the message so beautifully, and I think right. that's really the key because there are a lot of people that – I don't necessarily want to have out here on the program, even though they're kind of out there, because I don't think that the message there is really concrete, but you distill it in such a way and you are so articulate. And I think your academic background actually helps to contribute that because you look at it through almost a psychological lens. I mean, we've been speaking now for just over an hour and I can really get that sense. I, I, really, I, I really thank you for that. And, but I do want to say, and this is very, very important, the way I speak, my style of speaking, and if you see me in rallies, it's a little bit different. You know, mm -hmm. it's just one person's style. And I actually think that we have room for many, many different people and many, many different styles. And while, like, for example, I typically don't go on more lighthearted podcasts where it's more like jokingly, because even though I think I'm funny, not, not everyone <laughs> agrees, but, you know, that's not how I want to push the message. Other people are extremely well, extremely good at doing that, right? So so that to me is like an important thing. But you ask, how do I switch off? People have to remember, I have a full-time job as a professor and now I'm doing research. So it's a little bit quieter when the semester ended, but I'm still doing research. 
and I have a full-time job as a social activist, and I have a full-time job as a dad, <laughs> right? So I don't necessarily switch off as much as 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 much as I switch between my jobs, right? So when I'm with my kids, I try to be 100% with my kids. I fail, and sometimes you know I'm distracted, but I try to be. When I'm with my wife at the end of the day, you know, we watch some silly thing on TV or I read a, we read books next to each other. I try to be involved in that. When I'm doing my activism, I try to do that. Um, but I haven't found a balance yet. And I, I don't want to create a false narrative as if I'm some sort of hero who can do it all. Like, no, I'm just a human being who's trying to figure out all these things. And sometimes I fail. Sometimes I make mistakes. I hurt myself, unfortunately. I hate, I hurt I, other people in my life. My son has been spending less, I've been spending less time with him. So I try to make up for that. Sometimes I make mistakes on social media. It's okay. We're not supposed to be perfect. We're just supposed to be. And as long as you're doing something and acting and fighting for good, you know, you'll find ways to, to make it work. Well, we wanted to have you here on the program, Shai, not only because of the message and your journey, but also as inspiration to inspire others that everyone has a voice. And as you said earlier, it's just how you use that voice. And yeah, you've I, used it clearly in the way that is most appropriate for you. I I, tro I completely believe that. In fact, I've been thinking a bit about the story of David and Goliath. Mm. And you know, everyone remembers the story of David and Goliath. David is tiny. Goliath is estimated at nine foot tall, you know, but he has a slingshot and he hits him straight in the head and, you know, and then wins. What people don't or, or don't remember or don't acknowledge of the story of David and Goliath is what led up to the fight. So every day the, the, the Philistines headed by Goliath would come and taunt the Israelis uh, the, the Israelites, the uh, the, the Jews, Jewish people, and basically say, uh, send us your best man, we'll fight you, and then we'll determine it. And they would do it again, day in and day out, right? And Saul, who was King Saul, was supposed to be the leader. Everyone looked up to the leader. The leader did nothing, right? Which I think is very much related to what we're doing now. David was just a shepherd boy, right? He, but he, at one point, said, you know what? Enough is enough. I'm going to do something. There was nothing special about David other than the fact that he looked to the left, he looked to the right, he saw that no one is stepping up, and he realized that someone at some point must step up. And he probably said, you know what? That someone is going to be me. So it's, you know, we can all be Davids. We should all be Davids. And we should all stop looking for some King Saul, so for some leader to save us. It's up to us to stand up and, and save ourselves. And, and that is the message that I try to push for everyone. And on that ecumenical note, we're going to leave it right there. Shai Davide, I, I feel like I could talk to you for hours and hours. We want to thank you so much for joining us here on this episode of Israel Cast. And we would absolutely love to have you back, perhaps in the fall as things unfold, however they unfold. How's that? I would be, I would be honored. All right. And we'll have info about Shai on the show notes page of this episode on our website jnf.org slash IsraelCast. And of course, we do release new episodes of the show every other Wednesday. I don't know why you would want to miss an episode. So do subscribe, rate, and review us so you never miss an episode and you stay abreast of what we're doing here on IsraelCast. And as I said, don't forget to rate us five stars, of course, and share the show with your universe as well. Now, you can always enjoy the show by visiting us at our website. Once again, it's jnf.org slash IsraelCast. Now, as I say, it takes a whole Moshav to put IsraelCast together. For that, we thank Vivian Grossman, Dara Shapiro, J.D. Krebs, and Ellie Codron. Our editors are Jay Rothman and James Casada from Miratone Studios, right here in the very heart of New York City. And the music that you hear at the top and tail of the program is titled My Eden. It's by the very talented Rafi Malkiel from his album Water on the Tzadik label. IsraelCast is powered by Jewish National Fund USA, your voice in Israel. For more info about JNF USA, do visit jnf.org. And if you'd like to write to us with story ideas or just to say howdy, I know Shai would love to hear from you, and so would I. So do email us at IsraelCast at JNF.org. Meantime, I'm Stephen Shalowitz. Thank you for tuning in and looking forward to having you join us on future episodes of IsraelCast.